Very well, Mr. Boyce, your first witness. Yes, I do. Jeffrey James Zarillo. Uh, Z-A-R-R-I-L-L-O. Jeffrey is J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. Thank you. You're welcome. Very well, Mr. Boyce. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Zarillo. Good morning, David. Uh, let me begin by asking you to tell the court a little bit about yourself. Uh, how old are you? I'm 36 years old. And where did you grow up? I grew up in New Jersey. And how long have you been in California? I've been in California since 1999. Uh, do you have any siblings? I have one brother. Um, tell me about your parents. Are they married? My parents have been married for 41 years. Uh, is your brother married? My brother's been married for just about 14 years. Where did you go to school? I went to school at Brick Township High School in Brick, New Jersey. Uh, did you go to college? Yes, I did. I graduated from Montclair State University in Upper Montclair, New Jersey in 1995. Uh, are you employed? Yes, I am. Uh, what do you do? I work for AMC Entertainment Incorporated. The movie how, theater. how long have you done that? It's the only job I've ever had for 21 years. How'd you start? I started as a, as a ticket taker and worked my way up into a general manager of operations, which I currently am today. Um, are you gay? Yes, I am. Uh, how long have you been gay? As long as I can remember. Um, how long have you been openly gay? I came out in stages. I came out to some coworkers and, and friends that I had in California when, when I was 25, and ultimately uh, came out to uh, my friends and family in New Jersey when I was thir just about 30. Why did it take you so long? Coming out is a very personal and internal process. Excuse me. You have to get to the point where you're comfortable with yourself, with your own identity, and who you are. So it was difficult where I grew up um, the, you know, through, through school and, and, and peer pressure and, and the things you hear and the things you see and the things you read about with regards to uh, the gay and lesbian community. and what coming out means and, and that process that people go through and it changes you. It, ultimately, you get to the point where you are comfortable with yourself while previously when you were going through the process of deciding to come out, your thought process included what other people would think of you coming out. But it's not about that. It doesn't ma it's not about anybody else at that time. It's about me and how I felt growing up uh, in society with the, the, the stereotypes and, and, and hate that existed. Tell me a little bit about what you were referring to when you talked about what you read and what you heard and the stereotypes um, that you were faced with. I think we can all remember times in school whether it be grammar school, middle school, or high school, or college, that, and it didn't necessarily have to be about gay issues, but the peer pressure and the things that your friends and your, your acquaintances in school say, uh, especially when many of my friends at the time, uh, when I was going through this internal process, uh, identified themselves as straight and were, were dating women. and, and, and asking girls to the prom and, and to school dances. And, and those were, that was tough for me 
Um, I was someone that really wanted to, to go out for, for the football team, but I was afraid to, to be with, with men in the locker room. What were some of the things that um, you heard and uh, read about gays and uh, the stereotypes that you mentioned uh, that caused you concern before you came out? Objection, Yeah, I beg your pardon. I think it goes to the uh, uh, mental impressions of the witness, state of mind, objection overruled. I can remember specific times um, watching TV. Um, I, I, don't, I don't recall the name of the specific after school special, but it was an after school special about a child that came out to his parents and was kicked out of his home and told by his parents that they didn't love him, uh, not to come back. And uh, I remember uh, seeing a soap opera uh, called One Life to Live when I was in uh, middle school. And there was a, uh, Ryan Felipe played a, a gay kid on the show and uh, it was a similar situation where he found it so hard to come out in his community and in his home, and he was ultimately kicked out of his home by his father because his father didn't approve of him. Now today, you're in a committed relationship uh, with another gay man, correct? Uh, tell me a little bit about that man. The love of my life. I love him probably more than I love myself. I would do anything for him. I would put his needs ahead of my own. I would be with him in sickness and in health, in richer for poor, death or part, just like Bows. I would, I would do anything for him, and I want nothing more than to marry him. How long have you been in this relationship? March will be nine years. You said you wanted nothing more than to marry him. Why? The word marriage has a special meaning. It's why we're here today. It wouldn't, if it wasn't so important, we wouldn't be here today. I want to be able to share the joy and the happiness that my parents felt, my brother felt, my friends, my coworkers, my neighbors, of having the, the opportunity to be married. It's the logical next step for us. You believe that if you were married, that that would change the relationship that you have um, at all? Absolutely. I think, I think one's capacity to love can absolutely grow. I think one's capacity to be committed to another individual can absolutely expand. And I'm confident that that would happen with us. I believe that if you were able to be married, that would affect your relationships with your family and your community. Absolutely. How so? It's that I would be able to partake in family gatherings, uh, uh, friends, gathering with friends, co uh, work functions, as a married individual, and, and to, be, to stand alongside my parents um, and my brother and his wife, to be able to stand there as, a, as, a, as one family who have all had the opportunity to take advantage of, of, of being married and the pride that one feels when that, when that happens. You believe that if you were married, that would affect the way other people um, who don't know you deal with you? Sure. Why? 
when someone is married, and uh, whether it's a, an introduction with a stranger, whether it's a, 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 someone not, uh, noticing my ring or something of that nature, it says to them, these individuals are serious. These individuals are committed to one another. They have taken that step to be involved in a relationship that one hopes lasts the rest of their life. Now, do you, um, do you have children? No. Uh, have you thought about having children? Yes, we have. Um, have you talked about having children, the two of you? Yes. Um, why haven't you had children? Paul and I believe that it's import the important step in order to have children would be for us to be married. It would make it easier for, for us, for our children, to explain our relationship, for our children to be able to explain our relationship. But also, it would afford us additional protections for our child. And knowing that if we were going to enter into that type of family institution, that we want to make sure that we have all of the protections so that nothing could ever um, eradicate uh, that nuclear family. Now, you're aware that in the state of California, you could register with the state of California as domestic partners, correct? Yes, I am. Uh, have you done so? No, I have not. No, we have not. Why not? Domestic partnership would relegate me to a level of second-class citizenship, maybe even third-class citizenship, currently, the way, the way things are in California today. And that's not enough. It's giving me part of the pie, but not the whole thing. And while it is obviously an opportunity for us to do that, we hold marriage in such high regard that if we were to get married, we would be saying that we are satisfied with domestic partnership as a way to live our lives, but it doesn't give due respect to the relationship that we have had for almost nine years. Only a marriage could do that. Uh, do you have uh, friends who uh, have registered as domestic partners under the California state law? Probably. I, I, it's not something that's talked about. Friends uh, celebrate uh, anniversaries of registering as domestic partners? or No. No. Um, how does uh, not being married uh, affect you in your life? Does it subject you to discrim further discrimination? Yes, it does. How so? The discrimination, whether directly or indirectly, it's, it's pervasive. Uh, in this, especially after Prop 8, you, Prop 8 has emboldened the rest of, uh, has emboldened other states to uh, take similar actions. And that makes it difficult. You can't turn on the TV without hearing a news story about it. Can't log onto the internet without reading a news story about it. Can't open a magazine or read a blog. It's everywhere now. Those are daily reminders of what I can't have. Um, have you um, encountered um, instances uh, where, uh, because you are not married, um, you are placed in embarrassing or awkward situations? 
Yes, I have. Uh, can you give me some examples? One example is, is uh, when Paul and I travel, it's always an awkward situation at the front desk at the hotel. Uh, there's on numerous occasions where the individual working at the, at the desk will look at us with a perplexed look on his face as, and say, uh, you ordered a king size bed, is that really what you want? And uh, that's certainly an awkward situation for him and for us. And uh, uh, we, it is, it's very awkward. Uh, there's been an occasion where I've had to open a bank account. Uh, Paul and I had to open a bank account, and it was certainly an awkward situation walking to the bank and saying that my, my partner and I want to open a joint bank account and you know, hearing, you know, is it a business account, a partnership? Or what, yeah, it would just be a lot easier to describe the situation. might not make it less awkward for those individuals, but it would make it crystallize it more by being able to say, my husband and I are here to check in for our room. My husband and I are here to open a bank account. Um, are you ever um, confronted with situations where you're asked to describe your marital status? Yes. Uh, what do you do in those situations? Those are very awkward situations because um, as an individual who's very proud of his relationship and has been in a committed relationship for, relationship for almost nine years, I proudly wear my ring on, on my left hand to signify that. And it's very common that at, when we, if we're out at a work function or, or uh, a gathering with friends, someone identifies the ring and, and says, oh, how long have you been married? Or, or what does your wife do? Uh, questions of, of, of that awkward nature. Uh, leaving me to then have to uh, deliver the news that, that I'm a gay man and, and uh, I, my husband or my domestically partnered friend uh, is, uh, works in the fitness industry. And then that sort of, sort of creates additional awkwardness in the conversation. Now, uh, Assume that the state of California continues to tell you that uh, you can't get married uh, to someone of the same sex. Um, might that lead you uh, to desire to get married and marry somebody of the opposite sex? No. Why not? <laughs> I have no attraction, desire to be with a member of the opposite sex. I think if somehow um, you're able to be forced into a marriage with somebody of the opposite sex, that would lead to a stable, uh, loving relationship? Again, no. Honor, I have no more questions. Very well. Mr. Very well. Cross-examination? No cross-examination. No cross Very well. Then Mr. Uh, Cirillo, sir, you may step down. Thank you, Your Honor. I do. State your name, please. Paul Katami. K A T A M I. P A U L. Good morning, Mr. Katami. Good morning. Um, 
Would you, uh, would you tell the court a little bit about yourself? How old are you? I'm 37 years old. And where'd you grow up? I grew up here in San Francisco. Um, and uh, do you have any siblings? I do. Uh, how many? I have two. I have an older sister and an older brother. Um, and where do your parents live? My father lives here in San Francisco, and my mother lives in Santa Clara, Cal California. Uh, where did you go to school? Uh, you want the whole run? <laughs> I'll summarize it. <laughs> um, well, I went to school here at uh, St. Anne's of the Sunset, and then went to St. Ignatius College Preparatory for Boys in the city, and then I went to Santa Clara University, and then I went to UCLA for graduate school. Um, and what degrees do you have? Um, the highest degree is a Master of Fine Arts. Uh, where are you employed? Currently employed for Equinox Fitness. What do you do there? I am a manager of group fitness. Uh, now, uh, you were sitting in court when Mr. Zerillo described your relationship, were you not? I was. Um, and um, we don't have to go through again how long that's gone on, but I would like, like you to uh, uh, tell me whether uh, you would like to get married as well. I would, most definitely. Um, incidentally, did you tr try to get married uh, here in California? We did not. Um, the, um, uh, did you go to apply for a marriage license? That we did. Um, and what happened when you applied for a marriage license? Oh, we were denied that license. When was that? That was in May of 2009. Um, why did you want to get married? There are many reasons. Um, I think the primary reason for me is because I found someone that I love and that I know I can de dedicate the rest of my life to. Um, and when you find someone who is not only your best friend, but your best advocate and supporter in life, um, it's a natural next step for me to want to be married to that person. Uh, do you think if you were able to get married, that that would in any way change your relationship with Mr. Zerilla? I think it would. In what way? Being married allows us access to the language, I mean, being able to call him my husband is so definitive. It changes our relationship. We currently struggle in certain circumstances about what to call each other. We both dislike lover. <laughs> um, you know, it's just, it's a challenge. But husband is definitive. It's something that everyone understands. It's, there's no subtlety to it. It is absolute. And it also comes with a modicum of respect and understanding that your relationship is not temporal, it's not new, it's not something that could fade easily, it's something that you've dedicated yourself to and you're committed to. Mr. Zerillo talked about the desire to have children. I'd like to ask you, what, what are your views about having children? I would love to have a family. Why haven't you so far? I think the timeline for us has always been uh, marriage first before family for many reasons. But for us, marriage is so important because it solidifies the relationship and it, we gain access to, again, that language that is global where it won't affect our children in the future. They won't have to say, my dad and dad are domestic partners because not everyone knows what exactly domestic partnership is. Um, so by having access to that language, again, it makes it definitive. And beyond the language, having a marriage would grow our relationship. It represents us to our community and to society. And by raising a family and knowing what our parenting skills would be like, we'd want our children to be protected from any awkwardness or anything like that. We would want to focus on raising our kids. Do you think your children would be at a disadvantage uh, if you were not married, and if they could not describe their parents as being married? 
to a certain extent I do. I believe that children that are not in a, a married home are just as susceptible to awkward discussions or whatever it might be in schools, outside of school. So do I believe that a marriage creates a more stable home for our children? In our case, that's what we believe. We need to be married before we have kids. Do you think that whether or not you're married affects the relationship that you and Mr. Zerillo have to the broader community, to people that you meet and deal with? goes again to the state of mind of the uh, witness. I can safely say that if I were married to Jeff, that I know that the struggle that we have validating ourselves to other people would be diminished and potentially eradicated. I know how I've felt when people have asked, an LLC or an S corporation? No not my business partner, my partner. A puzzled look, because we're gay. Unless you have to deal with that, unless you have to go through a constant validation of self, there's no way to really describe how it feels. And I'm a proud man. I'm proud to be gay. I'm a natural born gay. I love Jeff more than myself. And being excluded in that way is so incredibly harmful to me. I can't speak as an expert. I can speak as a human being that's lived it. Now you say you were a natural born gay. Um, um, does that mean you've always been gay? As long as I can remember, yes. Um, uh, have you been always openly gay? I have not. Um, uh, when did you come out? It was a gradual process. Um, I struggled with it quite a bit. Um, being surrounded by what seemed everything heterosexual, you know. Um, you tend to try and want to fit into that. Because when you are considered different from the norm, you're subject to all kinds of issues and situations that you want to avoid, you shouldn't have to deal with in life. So as hard as you try, and I did, I tried to identify, I tried to, I succumbed to peer pressure. I had a girlfriend in high school um, because you needed to have one to go to the prom or to go to the game or whatever it might be. Um, so those pressures won over my being at that time so in high school, I was able to confide in a few friends. And I don't think it was necessarily, well, we all think no one knows, but they kind of always do. <laughs> so when you do confide in friends and family, they're like, yeah, we, we're just waiting for you to be ready. Um, and I was never a big believer of presenting myself as gay as an issue or a problem. I never wanted to sit someone down and say, I have a serious thing to tell you as if it were some deep, dark secret that it was a bad thing in my life. Because many times in those instances in high school and college, being gay is associated with something that's undesirable. Well, that's gay. You know, well, that's me. So I'm in that category now. So it was very difficult, but I found friends that I trusted, family that I trusted, and I was able to come out um, in a gradual process. And I always told myself that I would come out in a way that was exemplary to who I was. I wasn't going to present it as a problem or something that I, even though I had struggled with it and fought with it for many years, I was going to put a good face to it and say, listen, this is my boyfriend. I'm bringing him home for Thanksgiving, you know? and. Um, and that would lead to the discussion. And that has would. proven, huh? I said I bet it would. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was just, again, in that effort of trying to identify surely who I was versus leaving any speculation that it was not who I really truly was as a person. Uh, have you experienced uh, discrimination uh, as a result of being gay? I have. Can you give me some examples? Um, one example that I remember very clearly is um, the first time 
in college with some gay friends going to my first gay establishment, like a bar or a restaurant socially. And we were on an out, in an outdoor patio. And um, rocks and eggs came flying over the fence of the patio. We were struck by these rocks and eggs. And there were slurs. And you know, again, we couldn't see who the people were. But we were definitely hit. And it was a very sobering moment because I just accepted that as, well, that's part of our struggle. That's part of what we have to deal with. And um, it's very clear to me because I was finally feeling comfortable in my skin. <laughs> and um, it's just a constant reminder, that reminder of you're still going to deal with these, um, these issues. Um, more currently, discussions and amicable arguments, if that's not an oxymoron, <laughs> um, dealing over certain rights, particularly Prop 8, has led to a lot of discussions and um, intense discussions about my rights and why I should be able to get married. And a lot of those discussions included language like, well, what's the big deal? Why do you care? Don't you get most of the same rights anyway? And other emotional responses like, well, marriage is not for you people anyway. And once again, it goes back to that place where you hear that and regardless of how proud you are, unless you've experienced that moment, regardless of how proud you are, you still feel a bit ashamed. And I shouldn't have to feel ashamed being gay doesn't make me any less American. It doesn't change my patriotism. It doesn't change the fact that I pay my taxes and I own a home and I want to start a family. But in that moment, being gay means I'm unequal. I am less than. I'm undesirable. I have been relegated to a corner. And I'm tired of living my life that way. I'm tired of those constant reminders because I don't think of myself as a bad person. I don't think of myself as someone who needs to be put in a corner and told that you're different. It's not for you. It is for me. What were the circumstances when somebody said marriage isn't for your, you people or whatever it was that you said? Uh, yeah, and I was paraphrasing. There was other choice words that I have. <laughs> probably forgotten. Um, that particular incident, incident, uh, incident was in traffic in Los Angeles. And as you know, that's like having coffee with someone in the car next to you. So you deal with sitting next to this person over and over again for many miles. And I noticed <laughs> that this person had a Yes on 8 campaign sticker on their bumper sticker. And I was like, oh, great. And I just thought to myself, I'd miss want to see who this person is because this campaign sticker had an image that was disturbing to me and it was just you know in the middle of this and I just pulled up and I just looked over and I got a very distinctive what look back and I simply said through my window my window and sunroof was, were open and I said I just disagree with your bumper sticker she said Marriage is not for you people anyway. And I thought, God, do I have a gay flag on my car? Like, what's going on? How does she even know that I'm a gay individual? Um, and I find, I normally think that I'm pretty good at being able to retort and come back with, you know, something to support myself, but I was in shock. Um, I remember getting home and telling Jeff, I was like, I lost every, I, I mean, I couldn't even respond. I was like, really? Like, I don't know. I just said I disapprove. I mean, I, I should have the right to disagree. And this person turns to me and says, no, you don't have that right, nor do you have the right to get married, or nor should you. And it rocks you to your core. What was the image on the bumper sticker that you said was disturbing to you? I remember it was a yellow, blue, yellow, green bumper sticker, and it had, like, 
an image that looked like a parent and a child, like they were connected. And again, I haven't seen it for quite, a, quite some time. So, But I remember there being a child, like two figures, parent, child type of thing. And um, it just reminded me of the use of children in the campaign that frustrated me and I disagreed with. Say the use of children in the campaign, can you explain what you mean? Yeah, this one's a tough one because uh, protect the children is a big part of the campaign. And when I think of protecting your children, you protect them from people who perpetrate crimes against them, people who might get them hooked on a drug, a pedophile, or some person that you need protecting from. You don't protect yourself from an amicable person or a good person. You protect yourself from things that can harm you physically, emotionally. And so insulting, even the insinuation that I would be part of that category. So far away from that category. But to lump this issue into protect your family, protect your children, that invokes to me that we're some sort of perpetrator. That my getting married to Jeff is going to harm some child somewhere. And it's so damning. And it's so angering. Because I love kids. If you put my nieces and nephews on the stand right now, I'd be the cool uncle, <laughs> right? And to think that you had to protect someone from me, from Jeff, from our friends and from our community. There's no recovering from that. There is no recovering from it. And then to back it up by saying, oh, but these kids will learn about you. Well, they learn about a lot of things in school. So I say be a parent. Talk to your children about it. But don't point your finger at me and put me in that category, because I'm so far from that category. Let me show you um, some of the things that you may be referring to. Um, and Your Honor, at this time, I would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 99, which is one of the campaign videos. And I offer it subject to the reservation of objection that the defendants have already uh, reserved. 99? Yes. On the list of number It was one of the ones that we, I think it was one of the ones that we sent them last night. Yes. Yeah. Or it appears it's that uh, it was identified last night for the first time. Right. I have is, it's a protectmarriage.com video entitled, It's Already Happened. Yes, Your Honor. Hold on one second, Your Honor. Very well. The order with respect to identifying the exhibits to be used with a witness. Is that it? It is on the plaintiff's exhibit list, which was filed on the 7th. Your Honor, I, I think it was disclosed at the appropriate time. If you, if I can what you're offering it is subject to the objection that exactly. counsel has just made? Yes. Very well, well then, subject to that objection. Exhibit 99. Plaintiff's exhibit 99. Play that now. Mom, guess what?
Guess what I learned in school today? What, sweetie? I learned how a prince married a prince, and I can marry a princess. Think it can happen? It's already happened. When Massachusetts legalized gay marriage, schools began teaching second graders that boys can marry boys. The courts ruled parents had no right to object. Under California law, public schools instruct kids about marriage. Teaching children about gay marriage will happen here unless we pass Proposition 8. Yes on 8. Now, when you see the line there that says, protect our children, restore marriage, how does that make you feel? Well, I'm going to go to speak to what are you protecting your children from? To me, are you protecting them from the knowledge that certain people exist and desire certain rights? If that's what you're protecting them from, then maybe the word protect should be considered. Um, to me, the threat that is implied is insulting. And I think that there are ways to convey a message without potentially demonizing a group of people or creating fear around a certain group of people. I think it's unfair. I don't think it's very just. Um, Your Honor, I would offer at this time another video, which is Plaintiff's Exhibit 401. It is the video Stand Up for Proposition 8. Offer it again, subject to the same object, objection that the defendants have reserved earlier today. Not working, so I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be seeing it here. Very well. Well, what that means is that the witness, <coughs> excuse me, what, what that. I Very well, I, I understand. Uh, what I think is probably fair under the circumstances is that uh, the witness will have to remain available for any uh, questions that uh, the proponents wish to propound of this witness related to the exhibit that has uh, been designated uh, in less than 48 hours. Uh, I believe it was designated on January 6th, and I believe we can demonstrate that. All right, well. We'll deal with them off, off, if, offline. If, if that is the case, then that would resolve the matter. If it is not the case, what I think is fair to both sides is to have the witness remain available so that uh, the witness can be examined with respect to any late designated documents. Yes, Your Honor. All right. I hate to interrupt, but this, is this monitor supposed to be working? Because it's not. <laughs> I was watching over your honor's shoulder, sorry. <laughs> um, what's that? Yes. I don't think so. We just played 99. We are now going to offer, and we have just offered, 401, and we're now going to play 401. We have not played 401 yet. We've played 99. Okay, thank you. Then in that case, Exhibit 401 was not disclosed at all. And it was not in the uh, email that's dated January 10th. Your Honor, it's noon. I think we can demonstrate to them that we disclosed this on, on January 6th. Um, uh, but um, th this is one of the campaign videos. Everybody knows what these videos are. Um, uh, Your Honor, can I just have a moment? All right, why don't you take a minute and um, consult with your colleagues, and we'll proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. See if you can get that monitor up and running. Thank you.
Your Honor. Yes, sir. Um, uh, exhibit 99, the one we've already played, was properly disclosed on January 6th. Uh, exhibit 401 was not. So 401 is a exhibit that they have not had prior notification of. Um, uh, we, I, having checked the list exactly right now, I note that uh, they were not um, they were not given a notification of that. Um, Are you withdrawing 401? Uh, Your Honor, um, I think this is a situation in which um, it would be appropriate to play it with a witness. We'll keep the witness available if they've got any questions about it. It's a video from the campaign. Um, it's a video, video featuring Ron Prentice, the chairman of protectmarriage.com. Uh, it is one that everybody knows about. There's no surprise. There's no prejudice. Um, uh, I apologize for the inadvertent omission of the, of the document from the list, but I don't think there's any prejudice. I think it will facilitate the orderly examination to introduce it and play it at this time. Counsel? Your Honor, your order is uh, very clear that exhibits that are not identified shall not be used at trial when it certainly is a surprise to us that this video would be used. And it, it is a surprise, and certainly if we knew it had, was going to be used, we could prepare accordingly. And your pretrial order serves a very distinct purpose, and our position is that it should be enforced. Well, it does serve a uh, useful purpose. Uh, what, in view of the fact that this is a, a campaign statement that was made by your client, uh, is the prejudice to your client of allowing it to be used and then holding uh, the witness for any examination with respect to that uh, particular exhibit for at least 48 hours, which would essentially um, rectify any prejudice that uh, your client may have suffered. Oh. Isn't that a cure? Your Honor, it is a cure uh, to a certain degree. However, our objection would stand and, um, of course, you're free to uh, proceed <laughs> accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad you're... Well, I'm delighted to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted you to know that. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we proceed on that basis? And I'll urge both sides, um, be sure to check those exhibit lists and be sure that you make them complete and and up to date, I realize that uh, you've been working hard preparing this case for trial. We're only on the first day, and there are bound to be, be, a, be a few slips along the way. But uh, it wouldn't appear, given the nature of this particular exhibit, that there would be any great uh, prejudice to your client in allowing it to be used. But if there is, uh, th this witness will have to remain available. Thank All you, right? Your Thank you, Your Honor. Proceed. Um, could we now play? Um Plaintiff's Exhibit 401. Monitor working? Uh, yes. Proposition 8 is very straightforward. It defines marriage as being between one man and one woman. That's if it. If Prop 8 fails, the concept of what a family is will be redefined and it will be up for grabs. And it's not just for, for us, it's for our children. The devil wants to blur the lines between right and wrong when it comes to family structure. But our children aren't confused about what marriage is and about what men and women are. If Prop 8 fails, it opens up the door for all the other laws that the homosexual agenda wants to enforce on other people. And we will see a further demise of the family. Gender-friendly bathrooms. Religious liberties. If California loses on the subject of marriage, then this goes nationwide. How California goes, the rest of the country will go. Nationwide. This is where marriage it's the symbol of our salvation, the symbol of our relationship with Christ. And if we can't stand up and protect that, what will we stand up to protect? I know so many Christians that are walking in fear, but the Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love and a sound mind. It requires that everyone be registered, that they're voting, that don't be afraid, that they tell their friends, their neighbors. If someone believes in same-sex marriage, you say you believe in biblical marriage. We cannot be ashamed to stand up for Jesus Christ. Do what he did. He stood up for you in the public forum. Now you stand up for him. Don't be like Peter and deny him.
Every vote is going to count. We've got a lot of people on the streets. We've got a lot of people on phones. The churches coming together, pastors coming together. It's an unprecedented response from Californians. I think it is very, very doable. This is a winnable battle. I see God doing something amazing. I think he's giving America a second chance. California could be the springboard to send this across the nation. What you're hearing oftentimes in the media is different from what we know to be true. That it could also be the state that stops it. Let me encourage you to stand up for what's right, speak out on what's right, and go to the polls and vote yes on Prop 8. How did you feel seeing that uh, video, and in particular the last line, stand up for righteousness, vote yes on Proposition 8? Objection, Your Honor. Council represented that this was a video that was produced by techmarriage.com at the point in this case. There's been no foundation to that effect. It doesn't appear that it is. And to the extent that the witness is going to testify as to how this particular admin made him feel is of no relevance to this case. Voice? Your Honor, what I, what I said was it was a campaign video featuring Ron Prentice, chairman of protectmarriage.com. Uh, if, if counsel is saying it was produced by somebody other than protectmarriage.com, that's not something that I have uh, a, a knowledge about. What it is, it was a campaign video. Everybody has agreed it's a it was a campaign video. And it's featuring uh, the chairman of protectmarriage.com, Ron Prentice, who played a very prominent role in it. Um, uh, the purpose of this um, is to show the effect of these kinds of ads uh, on uh, Mr. Katami and, and, and through him, uh, other members of the gay community. Uh, I think that that is an entirely legitimate purpose. Uh, giving Mr. Prentice's role in that, regardless of who actually uh, produced the video. Anything further, counsel? Your Honor, just, just to the extent that it's been characterized as a campaign video, which is a part of the official campaign uh, uh, statement, there's no foundation for that whatsoever. I believe the question to the witness is what his reaction was to seeing this exhibit and I think that question is proper without regard to the uh, specific origin of the uh, campaign advertisement. Objection will be overruled and I'll remind counsel although this is a court trial I do generally try to discourage uh, speaking objections but uh, I realize we may be a little more liberal with some of the rules of uh, procedure here than would be true in a jury trial, but uh, you might bear that in mind. Very well. Do you have the question in mind? Could you repeat the question, please? Sure. Um, uh, when you saw this video, and particularly the last uh, tagline of the video that says, stand up for righteousness, vote yes on Proposition 8, uh, how, if at all, were you affected by that? I do remember that campaign ads like this, and, and this one included. Um, I'd be lying if I said if I didn't sit here, my heart was racing and I was angry watching it. I mean, again, stand up for righteousness. Okay, so we're a class of citizen or a category of people that need to be stood up against for some reason. And not to even mention what I find most disturbing is the references to the devil blurring lines and don't deny Jesus like Peter did and this oncoming freight train. Well, what happens to you when a freight train hits you? You're going to be either majorly harmed or killed by that, right? So to be categorized as a person that's part of a community, that's part of an effort to do one thing. We don't want to do one thing. We don't want to perpetrate against anyone. We don't want to force anyone to do anything. I love Jeff Zerillo. I want to get married to Jeff. 
I want to start a family. I'm not going to go out and start some movement that's going to harm any institution or any person or any child. I'm not, you know, and, and this is offensive to people of faith. I have a lot of friends who are people of faith. To categorize them as the devil or even put them in the same category, I mean, of, of some effort that is likened to the devil blurring the right li lines between right and wrong. I would think that those lines between right and wrong are talking about things that are bad in nature, that harm people and society. We're not trying to do that. I just want to get married. I mean, it's as simple as that. I love someone. I want to get married. And so an ad like this goes again. It, it just demeans you. It just makes you feel like people are putting efforts into discriminating against you. And although they have the right to believe what they want to believe, it doesn't make that legitimate or reasonable to me in my life when it infringes upon my rights, when it changes the way I identify myself or the way I feel about myself. That's unacceptable. Your Honor, uh, I would next offer a Plaintiff's Exhibit 350, um, a video entitled Gathering Storm. This is a video that re was released in 2009. And again, I offer it subject to the